Shalom, shalom, friends. Thanks so much for being here, um, wherever you are in the world today. We're so glad you could join us for part two of Jewish military ethics, a comparison of being a soldier in the diaspora and in the Israeli army today. This is uh, such an important topic. Um, we know that our hearts are with Am Yisrael, our hearts are with the Jewish people um, who are still grieving from the tragedy of October 7th um, and, and uh, longing for the return of all of the hostages um, from that have been taken from Hamas and continue to be in a difficult situation with global global pushback. Uh, of course, we also mourn uh, the loss of innocent life in, in Gaza um, and understand that what makes Israel great is not primarily our power, even though power is necessary, but what makes us great um, are, is our Torah and our ethics. And so it's important that we always balance um, our commitment to power and survival with our ethics. And those aren't always at odds. And Rav Ian, um, whose bio I'm not going to read because we introduced him last week and you know him already, if um, perhaps. Um, but um, Alex is going to share it in the in the chat there now. Also, if you didn't hear the uh, first session, uh, we're also going to post that recording in the chat as well, if you'd like access to that. And um, this will be a frontal presentation for about, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Um, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat during if you'd like, other, but otherwise we will have 20 to 30 minutes for a Q&A after. Um, and with that, we welcome you all and um, we welcome Rabbi Pear. Thank you for being here. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Rav Shmuley. Thanks again for everyone uh, to come and join uh, for some learning today. Um, just going to pick up where we left off last week. If you weren't with us, that's not a problem. Um but basically, I wanted to look at the difference for an individual Jew uh, in his experience, and it was primarily uh, him, uh, his, uh, his experience in a army in the diaspora. We're talking when, uh, you know, in Russia, Poland and the like, Austria, Hungary, uh, and what it would be like to be in, uh, uh, you know, a room, uh, what it would be like to be in uh, the Israeli army and how different it is for the individual experience. What I want to do this week is to show how the Israeli army itself uh, is very different than all of these previous armies in which uh, uh, Jews served in. And the prison by which I want to do that is I want to look at one person uh, and some of his halachic writings uh, that probably had the greatest influence on the nature of the modern day Israeli army, even up until today. Uh, and that's Rav uh, Shlomo Gorin. Rav, Rav Gorin uh, was born in Poland. Um, just quick biographical session. Uh, he moved, um, I think, in 1925 or thereabouts. Uh, he was known as an Ilui. He was a, a great Talmudic scholar. Age 12, already recognized as a tremendous scholar. He wrote a couple of books, I think, already by the time he was age 17. He ends up going to Hebrew University, studying mathematics, philosophy. But, of course, his first love is, is rabbinics. Um, and then, of course, uh, the need to defend ourselves uh, takes place in the 30s and the 40s. And Rav Gorin is involved in that effort, uh, so much so that he is brought in to sort of lead the, uh, the, the nascent Jewish army um, in 1948. The, and he creates a military rabbinate. Uh, he's going to go on after the military rabbinate to become the chief rabbi of the army from 1948 until 1968, I think. He then goes on to become the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, and then he is elected to be the chief rabbi, uh, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi uh, of Israel. And he has some really very fa fascinating halachic decisions. Um, Rav Shmuley would be interested, of course, you know, he was, uh, uh, along with his father-in-law, his brother-in-law, was a well-known uh, well known vegetarian. He once was sent uh uh, to be involved in the uh, providing the hashgacha of a Canadian slaughterhouse. I guess the meat was eventually going to be transported to Israel. Uh, and that experience of having to provide the hashgacha at the slaughterhouse made him a lifelong vegetarian, which he writes about. Um, he's very committed to the concept of, of truth in his writings. Um, some of you may be familiar, there is a, a tefillah, we say, Kiddush Levana, sort of a sanctification of the new moon. And in this tefillah that we say, very often uh, Saturday night, people go out, maybe do a little dancing even. And we look up at the moon and we say, just as uh, we're dancing, 
but are unable to touch you. And then the prayer goes on. Uh, after the moon landing, he basically uh, changed the wording. He says, we can no longer say that because apparently human beings can touch the moon. So he was so committed to the accuracy of, of what we, what, we utter from our mouths. He said, we have to change it. We have to follow uh, what the reality is. And we're going to come back to that idea of his commitment to truth, um, even when it cost him certain certain things. Um, as he said, and what we're going to really focus on is his involvement in the army and his halakhic insights uh, into the, the Israeli army. Um, he was originally brought in to be sort of an outsider, to basically provide services to those soldiers um, who were religious, who wanted to make sure that they were observing uh, the Shabbat as much as they could and Kashrut and things along those lines, um, and to really speak to the religious audience within the army, which was at that time a minority. Um, and he did that job, and he did it actually quite well. There's a well-known story that uh, in between one of the, uh, the, the ceasefires in the 48 war, there was a great concern um, that the Jordanians were going to move tanks into Yushalayim. And it was on a Friday night uh, that he found out about this. And he went from yeshiva to yeshiva. Uh, there were no soldiers who had the, the the freedom of movement at that point. I mean, there just wasn't you know enough time to do everything. And, and he went and he recruited uh, uh, Haredi yeshiva students. Um, and he got them to leave the yeshiva. He got them to go out on Friday night to dig ditches. Uh, in the northern part of the city. So at the, the tanks came in on Shabbat morning, the next morning, they all got stuck in the ditches. And no one else could have made that argument uh, to the these religious yeshiva students, uh, said that you have to go out and violate Shabbat uh, for this purpose, except someone like a Rav Gorin. So Rav Gorin was known um, to be able to speak to the religious community. That's why he was brought in. One of his other, I think, major uh, innovations as in the religious world uh, as a chief rabbi is he very much promoted, and he he edited a new Sidor for soldiers, uh, which tried to combine Ashkenazi and Sephardic tradition in one Sidor, because another of his great values was was unity. Um, and he very much was uh, interested to have uh, things that could bring people together from different backgrounds rather than separate them. So he tried to push that when people would come into the army, they would use the same Sidor. There would only be one minion, not two or three or more than that. Um, however, uh, his greatest contribution, I think, to his army service uh, laid in not speaking to the religious community, but trying to elevate and make the entire army more Jewish. Uh, I think I referenced last week how he did that in the world of Kashrut, that uh, he had an argument with Ariel Sharon, and Ariel Sharon said to him, I don't mind if religious Jews uh, have only kosher food, but we're not going to waste the money and make sure that every secular uh, soldier who doesn't really care also has uh, kosher food. And not until there's one religious soldier in my unit, am I prepared to, um, you know, and he was a uh, head of the paratroopers, am I prepared to uh, make my unit kosher? Uh, to which, of course, at that point in time, he was highly ranked at that point in time as as, as a rabbi. Uh, Rav Goran volunteered to be a paratrooper. He jumped out of a plane. He promptly broke his leg as soon as upon landing. Um, but Ariel Sharon visits him in the hospital and says, fine, you proved your point. You've joined my unit. I will now make my unit kosher as well. What I want to focus on tonight, however, is not how he made the army more ritualistically Jewish, uh, but really uh, made the army more ethically Jewish and more spiritually Jewish. Uh, and before I give you the actual sources that we're going to see of his writings, uh, I want to point out that he had a, a great obstacle, really four obstacles at least, in trying to infuse uh, Jewish tradition into the army. Uh, the first challenge for him is he had to argue with the secular elite, the secular leaders of the country and of the army. Um, people like David Ben-Gurion was not opposed to Jewish values in Israel in general and in the army in particular. However, if you asked him what are Jewish values, he was very clear about it. Biblical values. We are the people of the book. The book is the Tanakh, the Bible. Um, and we were returning to the land of the Bible. And David Ben-Gurion had no problem uh, instituting biblical ideas and figures and values into the, the nascent Jewish state and the nascent Jewish army. However, he looked askance upon things like 
the Mishnah and the Talmud and the subsequent rabbinic development of, of how the Bible should be interpreted. He looked askance upon how halacha developed over thousands of years, both in Israel, the land, as well as outside in the diaspora. That was not the type of Jew he was interested in, and he did not want that entering into the calculations of what makes a Jewish army. So Rav Gorin very much wanted to have an interaction and a conversation with Ben-Gurion and the like, uh, but he knew their sensitivities. And so he had to somehow tie into their acceptance of Tanakh, which he, of course, also accepted, uh, but also somehow sneak in subsequent Jewish uh, traditions and values. On the other end of the spectrum, he had to respond to a variety of, of religious attacks uh, against what he wanted to do. There are three in particular, uh, and each of them, I think, um, I think they reflect a deeper uh, fight and value going on. So just very briefly, I'll mention uh, there were the ultra-Orthodox, uh, the Haredi Jews who felt that the Jewish state had no authority to engage in war at all. Not until the coming of the Messiah, not until the reconstitution of the king, of the Sanhedrin, did we have the power and the right to uh, send people into war. So uh, Rav Gorin, however, uh, was able to respond to that uh, idea by suggesting, based upon the teaching of Rav Kook, which is actually based upon a Rambam, that the kingship could is, is a concept that could be understood in other ways. So, for example, Rav Kook would argue that democracy is a form of kingship, a form of sovereignty, and thus the Knesset could serve as the reconstitution of that role of the kingship. And therefore, there was authority to uh, to influence the army in that regard. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, everything's underpinning deeper ideas. And I think in this case, um, the deeper idea that uh, Rav Gordon was trying to make is that we do not need to wait, even if things are not perfect, uh, we can be part of the redemptive process. It doesn't need to all come from above. The second argument uh, was with people of his own what we call Dati Lumi community, the religious Zionist community. Uh, they basically said, listen, for, for so long we've been without a state. We don't have any of the halachic development that we've had in everything else. You know, Kashrut's developed for 2,000 years of give and take and thinking and the codes and Mishnah Torah and the Shulchan Aruch. We don't have any of that when it comes to issues of war and the like. So we have to take a back step. Halacha is not sophisticated enough to engage in these type of topics of what's the proper way of, of going to war. Um, and so, for example, one rabbi, Rav Shaul Yisraeli, he compared it to like, uh, you know, you don't get involved in medical issues. You ask the doctor, what's the right thing to do? That's all we can do as well. We can ask the generals what's the right thing to do, but but Jewish law does not get involved. Uh, he made it uh, a parallel, an analogy to the halacha concept, Dina de Malchut Dina. This is a concept that says, you know, when you're living in America, you follow the laws of the land uh, because you're living in that land. And that becomes a Jewish concept. So he says it's very similar. The state of Israel is like an international dina de machut dina. Uh, we have to follow whatever the international laws are for good and for bad, meaning if they're stricter than we want to be, we have to follow those laws. If they're much more lenient than we want to be, we have the right to follow and just be like any other nation. But halacha is not sophisticated enough to engage in these conversations. And here too, Rav Gorin vehemently agreed, uh, disagreed. Uh, I'm reminded, um, you know, before the war broke out on October 7th, uh, we in Israel were in the midst of a uh, campaign season for municipal elections. And I happened to be on the list uh, for city council elections here in Jerusalem, and which was a big change for myself as well as many of the people in my community. And so I explained the reasons why I decided to, to run for office in a, in a long Facebook post. And I opened my Facebook post by writing, you know, I'm throwing my kippah into the ring. Um, and uh, you know, picking up on the, the common American expression, throwing my hat into the ring about getting involved. However, because about half the people on my Facebook uh, feed are Hebrew speakers, it automatically translates into Hebrew for many of them. And what they saw was, Ani zorechet akipa. In Hebrew, that has a connotation of, I'm throwing my kipa away. I'm giving up religion. The kipa is a symbol of my religion, and so I'm getting rid of everything. And I got a call or two from people saying, don't give it up. You should stay religious. Come on, don't give up everything. Please stay with us. And, and I mentioned that story because Rav Gorin 
felt, you never throw your kippa away. You never give up the opposite. You throw your kippa into the ring. That halacha has something to say about everything, and we have to do the hard work of finding what it has to say on these type of issues. So that was his second argument, second uh, challenge and argument to overcome it. And his third was with a group of people who said, fine, halacha has what to say about war, but the sources we have are primarily focused on individual uh, agency. For example, with the concept of Rodef. Rodef is someone who pursues someone, and the halacha states that if you're being pursued, you're allowed to have self-defense for you as an individual, and you can kill them before they kill you. So many people suggest, okay, we'll use those type of individual uh, cases to expand them out, to talk about how a, a nation should deal with war. And Rav Goren was very much against that. He says, that's criminal law. We have to understand that something new has taken place in the history of the world, in the history of the Jewish people. It's called the state of Israel. And because this is a new reality, it demands upon us to plumb our sources so that we can come up with more sophisticated ways of responding by simply than simply using criminal law for a national matter. Uh, he was very much into expanding the categories of halacha. Many of us are familiar with uh, mitzvot ben adam l'chaviro, right? Mitzvot between human beings or mitzvot ben adam l'makom, uh, commandments that have to do with us and God. He said there should be a third category, mitzvot ben adam l'medina, that there should be a category of what it means to be part of a state about a national collective. And that has an impact on how we look at issues of Shabbat and kashrut um, as a state. It's not just an individual, personal, familial matter. And he says that also has to have an impact on our army. It's not just a bunch of Jews in an army keeping kosher and Shabbat, but the army itself has to be reflective of deeper Jewish values. So how did he succeed in sort of pushing these values, both pushing back against the religious who challenged him, as well as the secular who he was trying to uh, integrate into his worldview? So he did a lot of different things. Uh, one of them, however, which I think is interesting, and I thought to spend just a minute on, um, and I'll share my screen for this purpose, the sources that he used very often to make his argumentation uh, were uh, biblical sources. We're very accustomed when you make an argument uh, in halacha uh, to, to use the Mishnah, the Talmud, uh, and everything along those lines, uh, the codes, Shulchan Aruch, Mishnah Torah, and he understood, however, that this was not going to speak to people like Ben-Gurion. It was a non-starter. So a lot of his sources come, for example, from the Book of Maccabees. And part of the reason it comes from the Book of Maccabees, well, I would say is a few, few things. One, of course, the Book of Maccabees is biblical. Uh, it took place while we were in the land of Israel. And so therefore, someone like David Ben-Gurion was not instantly turned off. He said, okay, okay I'm willing to learn what previous sovereigns did in this land when they had to fight. And of course, the Book of Maccabees involves story of the uh, Hashmonaim, the Hasmonians, the Maccabees, um, and what it was like to be sovereigns in the land. And we learned certain things from uh, the, the Book of Maccabees and the Hashmonaim in particular from religious points of view. For example, they were the ones who, who, who said, you violate Shabbat to fight war um, if need be, for saving life. That was an innovation that we hadn't yet 100% considered, uh, or at least 100% fully adopted until the time of uh, the Hashmonim, the Hasmoneans. Before then, very often people would approach war specifically on Shabbat because they thought the Jews would be at a disadvantage. And this was changed during that time. Uh, there's another reason why I think he uh, quoted from the Book of Maccabees, and that's because the story of Hanukkah, both is relevant to people who are fighting in a war, but also it allowed uh, Rav Goren to introduce some of the uh, rabbinic uh, theological values, even while celebrating a military victory. Because it's oh, fundamentally, it's a military victory, the story of Hanukkah, right? It's a story of bravery and courage and uh, military effectiveness. But the rabbinic understanding of that story doesn't deny that at all. 100% accepts it and, and celebrates it, but makes sure that it's celebrated in the proper context and connected to a deeper spiritual value. So if you see the source that I have in front of you, this is from an article he wrote in 1966, right before uh, the Six-Day War. 
The holiday of Hanukkah is also a symbol and a model of the victory of the few over the many. In light of the war's uneven nature and the specifically religious goals of the Greeks for whom it was a war of religious persecution to make them, the Jewish people, forget their Torah. Right? He saw it as a religious war. Nevertheless, the rabbis of the Talmud did not find it appropriate to emphasize the military victories, but rather the miracle of, I'm sorry, my typing is uh, very poor, uh, right? The military uh, of the oil and the menorah. And this comes to teach us the degree that the sages opposed the war and the people refrained from crowning the military heroes and the victors in battle. Rav Gorin was about celebrating the courage of the human spirit and the, the, the inspiration that, that Torah gave these warriors. But he was never about forgetting that the source of it all is ultimately God. You know, there's a lot of stories that tell uh, Rav Gorin, tell about Rav Gorin in the Six Day War. You know, there's that famous picture. Uh, Alex, maybe you even have uh, uh, have it that you could put it up. Of Rav Gorin at the, the Kotel uh, blowing the chauffeur. Um, he was one of the first ones there because the story goes uh, that Rav Gorin, not just in this instance, but in many instances, would ru run ahead of the actual... Uh, oh, do I need to stop sharing my screen? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, that Rav Gorin um, would run ahead of the actual... Uh, there you go, the famous story. You see him also holding the Torah. For him, very much, right? The war in war in general, the, the, the bulkhead was the Torah and the chauffeur, and therefore he actually ran ahead of everyone. I, I once heard a story about his driver who absolutely could not stand driving Rav Gorin because they would drive in the Six-Day War ahead of everyone, going down to Hebron, going down to Beit Lechem, ahead of the front line. And he would go there with his Torah, and he would go there with his chauffeur, and he would always try to run ahead. And the army couldn't stand it either because they always had to send troops to catch up with him both to protect him and make sure that, you know, he didn't mess up the actual assault. But he was always out there in front, but he was always out there in front of the Torah to make that uh, that that very important lesson clear to him. And so that's one of the ways he was able to bring people like David Ben-Gurion, as well as the other rabbis who opposed him, into his theater of, of thought, which is that it's, it's, it's a religious act, um, and that's what's underpinning our, our, great, our great victory. And maybe we'll come back to that idea in just a moment. But let me now, if I may, turn to the sources more seriously uh, and show how he uh, thought, uh, in, in at least one, one or two cases, uh, how he thought the military should behave uh, from a religious ethical point of view uh, and move it beyond just the theoretical to the more practical. So I'm going to share my screen again with you. I've tried to translate everything. So I'm going to show two, two cases, uh, two arguments between the sources that Rav Gorin weighs in on that I think shed some light on how we are meant to behave as, as soldiers. And I will also point out that not everyone agrees with Rav Gorin. Uh, this is not always the official Israeli position, but as I said, his voice is perhaps one of the most influential. So the first argument uh, that he weighs in on is a argument between the Ramban and the Rambam, Maimonides and Nachmanides, on the story that we're going to read in the Torah uh, fairly shortly. And that's the story of uh, Shechem. Uh, he rapes uh, Yaakov's daughter, Dina, and the brothers say, he says he wants to marry her, he loves her, and the brothers say, if you have a circumcision, not just you, but the entire town, have a circumcision, uh, then we will allow it to happen. Uh, they do, in fact, do that. But rather than allowing there to be a marriage that takes place, uh, the brothers go in and not only kill Shechem and his father, uh, the perpetrators of, of the rape and the terrible deed, but they end up killing all the other townspeople, the men, the male townspeople as well, who were three days into having their Brit Milah, were much weaker as a result. So it's a very violent a very violent scene. And the question that comes up is, were the brothers justified in killing not just the perpetrators of the deed, but all the other individuals, all the other people there who are somewhat, you know, innocent bystanders, so to speak, uh, in this in this, this behavior. So the, the Rambam, he says, they were justified to do so. And he writes this in his section 
uh, his in the Mishnah Torah, Malachim and Milchamot, you see the very first source. Um, he's talking about the seven, the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, the seven Noachide laws that all people have to follow in this world, not just uh, Jews. The whole world has to follow these seven fundamental laws, do not murder, uh, and the list goes on. And the seventh one is to set up court systems, legal systems, to adjudicate the previous six. So there you see in the first source, Ketza Mitzuyam Hem Aladinim, how are they commanded on this particular, uh, the laws of the, the seventh law of setting up courts? And he writes, You have to set up judges and magistrates in all your parts of your land. And they're supposed to adjudicate and judge these six other commandments. And they are meant to warn the entire nation about all these laws. And if there is a Ben, ben Noach, if there is a non-Jew that violates uh, one of these seven commandments, the punishment is death. And it's for this reason that all of the the residents of the town of Shechem were uh, were worthy of the punishment of death. Why? Because Shechem did what he did. He stole. He raped Dina. They saw it. They knew about it. And they did not take him to justice. They did not bring him to court, and they did not take care and punish him. They allowed this, this evil to remain in their midst. So says the Rambam, they violated one of the seven laws of the Noahide uh, creed, uh, and therefore they were guilty of death. That's the Rambam, and therefore he says that you know they, they were guilty, and you can see how this potentially could apply to a uh, current situation today as well. The Ramban, which I'll get to in a moment, disagrees. He says that's not the case. He says, in fact, he would go jump down a little bit. When I'm, I'll, I'll come back to what I'm skipping over in just a moment because it's interesting, I think. But the Ramban, I look in the English. He says, look at the look at the blessings that take place at the end of the book of Genesis when Yaakov blesses all of his sons, and he blesses Shimon and Levi, who are the ones who were the instigators of killing all of the uh, all of the people of Shechem. And look what the, look how Yaakov blesses them. And he gives a very harsh blessing to them. We'll see the blessing in just a moment. And the Ramban writes, Now I have already explained that Jacob was angry with Simon and Levi for having committed violence when they killed the people of the city of Shem. Because they, the people, had not sinned against them at all. They could have even made a covenant with them. They became circumcised. They could have potentially had the possibility of even entering to the house of Avram. And just as Avraham had brought other souls into the community um, in his conversion processes, maybe this would have been the group of people as well. They already did the circumcisions. So they the, the Simon and Levi acted quite inappropriately. He goes on to say that it was a chilu Hashem, desecration of God's name for what they did. So the Ramban very much disagrees with the Rambam of whether or not the general population in Shem were guilty or not. Here is, just so you see, the blessings that I mentioned at the end of the, the book uh, where Jacob uh, it says uh, the blessings uh, about uh, Simon and Levi. You see here, right? So here you see the uh, the blessings of Simon and Levi in particular. Shimon and Levi, their weapons are tools of lawlessness. Let not let not my person be included in their council. Let not my being be counted in their assembly. For when angry they slay a man, and when pleased they maim an ox. So he's Yaakov was very upset with them, and Ramban picks up on this. I should point out that not everyone agrees with the Ramban. Uh, and in fact, uh, the national poet, um, uh, Shaul Chernikovsky, right here, wrote a poem called Parsha Dina in 1936. And he imagines Dina, the sister, giving a similar blessing to what Yaakov does. Yaakov gathers his 12 sons at the end of his life uh, and gives each of one of them a blessing. And Dina gathers her 12 brothers before she's going into exile. At Chernikovsky's understanding and uses the same words that Yaakov, but very often the reverse. She she calls v'tishlach v'tikra She calls her brothers, whereas Yaakov calls his sons. And he, he she says, "Gather around before I separate from you, my brothers. I want to tell you something." And then she lays into them. Whereas, for example, Yaakov down here says to uh, uh, Ruvain, "Ruvain, you're my firstborn." You, you're my firstborn, and you have uh, 
my might and my first fruit of my vigor, exceedingly in rank and exceeding in honor. What does she say about Ruvain, who's her brother, who did not intervene in the rape? Ruvain, my brother, my big brother, you don't have exceeding in, in might. You're exceeding in flexibility. Uh, you're exceeding in your softness. She's upset with him for not being tough enough to help defend her. She's crying out and saying, we needed a little bit more toughness in this world. I'm sorry. I was abused and raped and kidnapped, and you did not come to my rescue. But Shimon and Levi, who we've seen Yaakov views as you know these very violent people and doesn't want to come in their midst, she uses the same language, but again, the reverse. She says, not, I'm not disgusted by you. I'm honored by you. You, your, your anger was something beautiful. It was protecting my dignity, protecting my life and, and my, and defending me. And so there were many people who felt that the Rambam has a point that sometimes you have to be tough. And, and for example, the Maharal, when it comes to issues and matters of war, he says, war is hell. It's terrible. That's why you try never to get into a war and you try to finish a war as soon as possible. But once you enter into the war, you have to prosecute it with such veracity and, and such, such effectiveness that you do not look to uh, or show concern for the other people in that society. You would not show concern to the innocence of the other people in Shechem. First of all, you need to have people be afraid of you, he would argue. But more than that, he says, this is the nature of war. If you think about, for example, uh, the U.S. and Japan or Germany, right? The idea was that the only way you get these nations to surrender is you have to attack the entire nation. And so, for example, the Maharal says, he doesn't say that each of these individuals, like the Rambam, were individually guilty because they could have stopped it. But he says, the whole nature of war is once a war exists, it's between two nations. It's not between individual people within those nations. And once it's between two nations, you do whatever it takes for one nation to win. And so, for example, in the case of Japan, the point was not to avoid targeting innocents, the opposite. The U.S. targeted innocents because it was the only way or the fastest way to break the will of the Japanese in general to bring about victory. And that's what the Maharal argues, and that's what Chernikovsky seems to be alluding to. And on some level, that's what the Rambam is perhaps getting at as well. So what does Rav Gorin do with this? Does he support the Rambam or the Ramban? So he threads the needle. And he basically says, listen, there are technical reasons why we could say that the Rambam is right, that these people in Shechem are not guilty according to the letter of the law. They didn't violate the law. However, the Ramban is also right not on a legal level, but on a moral, spiritual matter level. On a spiritual level, Yaakov is attacking them and saying, you acted inappropriately, not because you didn't follow the laws of the land. That's probably what people did in those days. Not because if we were a nation going against a nation, that you just have, no. But, but I, Yaakov, am trying to do something different, and I'm trying to do something special here. I'm trying to introduce the concept of godliness to the entire world. And it can't be done through your behavior. And so what the, the, the Rav Gorin says is, we can follow both of these ideas simultaneously, but we have to always remember the spiritual element in our fight, in our victory as well. And again, he's basically coming back to the story uh, of Hanukkah, right? That there's a military victory, but the military victory cannot come at the expense of a spiritual victory uh, at, the, at the same time. Okay. Let me move on to the next argument that exists that may also play a role. And by the way, I should point out, I'm not making any statements uh, about a particular policy that Israel should or should not follow in the current war. Uh, but I just want to sort of lay out at least the appropriate halakhic language and disputes so that we can elevate and, uh, and have our conversation be on a more sophisticated level. <laughs> I feel bad talking about sophisticated as I'm about to tell you this. Uh, one of the ways I understood the Maharal was that there, I came, I was listening to a podcast recently about something called uh, Predator P. Predator P, apparently, there's a big business of collecting the P from uh, zoo animals. And the reason why is 
animals are much more sensitive to smells than humans are. The, the deer has about a 60 times greater sensitivity to smell than the human nose. And so someone came up with the idea and realized that the only way uh, to sneak up on a deer, if you're hunting a uh, deer, is to douse yourself in pee of an animal that would not scare a deer, right? You know, like a little fox or a skunk or a rabbit. And if you douse yourself in this pee, you can get closer to the deer than you would otherwise, who otherwise would smell you right away. And, and I was thinking of that imagery of sort of supporting the Maharal, which basically says, once you've decided on the mission, that this is the mission that you have to do, you may have to get dirty in order to do so. Whereas what Rav Gordon says is, even still, you do your best to maintain the integrity outside of that need. And, and I could see, to be perfectly honest with you, both sides of this argument. Uh, but I, I, as I said, Rav Gorin's influence on the Israeli uh, military ethic is legion, so uh, that's why I include him. Now, the second argument that I want to talk about is a halacha that the Rambam brings based upon a midrash that also became relevant not too long ago, which was the idea of a humanitarian pass. Do you let people escape when you're fighting a war, right? When you're when you're trying to win, you want to punish the enemy and you tie one hand behind your back if you allow people to potentially escape. But there is a halakha that says that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And in 1982, Rav Gorin wrote that the Israeli behavior in Lebanon, where the siege around Beirut was on four sides, not allowing anyone to escape the siege at all, was against halacha. And many people attacked him and says, absolutely not, that's not true. And we'll see the basis of the argument in just a moment. His main contrarian was someone by the name of Rav Shaul Yisraeli, who I've mentioned already, uh, who was also a leading uh, rabbi in the Dati Lumi community. Um, and they argued over this particular Rambam that I'm uh, referencing right now, Okay, you see it uh, here uh, with regards to whether or not you are supposed to surround a city when you go to war and put it under siege on four sides, or do you do it on three sides, letting one side open so that people can escape? I'll say one thing sort of parenthetically about Rav Gorn, why I love him so much, is uh, Rav Gorn, when he writes uh, his literature, he writes this tshuva that I'm about to share with you now. Um, and as I said, he writes it in a newspaper article originally, and then he copies that newspaper article in his uh, in his book. Um, a month after he writes it, he is attacked viciously by Rav Shaul Yisraeli, who attacks him and says he's done all these terrible, terrible things. And in Rav Gorin's book uh, that he publishes from his own you know, money, he includes the entire attack from... Rav Shaul Yisraeli, that again, going back to this concept of truth, he wanted to include everything. It reminds me, I once heard a podcast, Malcolm Gladwell was talking about Rick Barry, the famous baseball pl uh, basketball player who used to uh, shoot the ball underhand, um, but he was very good at foul shots. And Malcolm Gladwell was picking on Wilt Chamberlain, who one year uh, shot uh, underhand, just like Rick Barry had taught him. And uh, he stopped doing it. And the reason why he said he stopped doing it, he said about uh, uh, Will Chamberlain, was, who was known as a terrible foul shooter, that he could have you know, scored much more than 100 points in that one famous basketball game. But he was too embarrassed what people thought about him if he would shoot the ball underhand, that he would look, he would look silly. And he said about Rick Barry, just didn't care what people thought about him. He didn't care if people thought you know, he was shooting the ball like, say, like a grandma. Didn't bother him at all. And in his autobiography that he wrote himself. He invited other people, including his mother and a brother and someone else, to write in their auto his autobiography about how terrible and selfish a person he was, because he just didn't care. Anyway, that podcast reminded me a little bit of Rav Gorin's courage to include people who disagree with him as well in his book. Okay, in the actual uh, the debate, the Rambam writes, when besieging a city in order to capture it, 
You should not surround it on all four sides, but only on three sides, allowing an escape of path for anyone who wants to take place. And we learned this from the war in Midian, where there is a, a tradition of this is what uh, is supposed to take place. You leave the fourth side open for people to escape. The Meshach Chachma actually says that you should leave one side open for a purely practical reason, that if you leave one side open, people will run away rather than fight to the death and it'll be better for your soldiers. But but Rav Gorin is not having any practical uh, any practical advantage here. He wants to talk on philosophical reasons. He says, this is the halacha. You have to leave one side open so people can escape and live. Rav Shaul Yisraeli says, no, we don't do that. And that's not, and because the, if you, they escape, they'll come back and they'll try to kill us some other time. And they have this very violent argument on principle, of course. And they are arguing over the Rambam of what case is he talking about? So uh, Rav, Rav Shaul Yisraeli says, the Rambam must be talking about the case of a uh, optional war. In the Torah, there are two types of war. There is a milchemet mitzvah and a milchemet reshut. A milchemet mitzvah is an obligatory war. It's a war you have to go and fight, and there are certain laws for that. An optional war, you want to sort of just expand your horizons a little. That's an optional, and that has different standards. Right? There, it has different standards of who you can uh, draft into that and also how you have to relate to the people you're going against war with. So the Rav Shaul Yisraeli says, in a milchemet mitzvah, an obligatory war, there is no leaving the fourth corner, the fourth side of the siege open. How do we know this? We know that in the there are three cases of an obligatory war: the war against Amalek, the war against the seven nations when Israel first enters into the land, and then a war where you're defending um, uh, oppressors, people who are trying to kill you. And he therefore says, since the first two do not allow for there to be an escape path in Amalek, for example, so therefore the third case also. And clearly the case in Lebanon, we were fighting against people who wanted to try to kill us. That's an obligatory war. And so therefore all obligatory wars, you do not leave the fourth side open. What the Rambam therefore must be writing about is a, permiss a permissible war. And a permissible war, you know, for your own self-aggrandizement, and you see it in the very first verse in the Hebrew, when you go out to capture a place, Right? This is not about defense. When you're going on the offense, then you leave the fourth uh, wall open. But if it's an obligatory war, you don't do it. You siege, complete, nothing gets in or out. Rav Gorin says, I disagree. First of all, I disagree because we learned this from the case of the war with Midian, which was also an obligatory war. And that's what the Rambam's quoting. So I think the Rambam is talking about an obligatory war. And he's saying you leave the fourth wall open also in an obligatory war. And I'll give you one more proof, he says. If you look just two halachot earlier, right? This is 6-7. In 6-5, he is describing the Rambam. The Rambam is describing the war of Yoshua when he comes to the land of Israel. And in the war of coming to the war, uh, the land of Israel, it says that Yoshua, Shosha ketavim shalach Yoshua ad shalom niklas la'aretz. Before Yoshua and the B'nai Yisrael entered the land of Israel to conquer it. They sent three letters. Harishon shalach lehem misha livroach yivrach. The first letter he sent to all the inhabitants there who he's about to go to war with is anyone who wants to run away should run away. The chazar v'shalach misha rotzeh la'ashlim yashlim. He then sent a second letter. And anyone who wants to make peace should make peace. And only then, and then he says, anyone who wants to go to war will go to war. And then it becomes activated of the halachot of four sides and you don't let anyone out. The fact that the Rambam writes that Yoshua gave an option for people to make peace or to run away first is proof that even in a biblical mandatory obligatory war, you nevertheless leave things open. And Rav Shaul Yisraeli says on practical grounds, don't you know what you're going to do? If you let terrorists get away, they're going to come back and they're going to attack again. And Rav Gorin says something, I find it very difficult what he says and incredibly powerful at the same time. He says, I don't view this from a, the lens of the military. I view it as a religious commandment. It's something unique about the Jewish perspective on war. It's about the value of peace. It's not about the value of succeeding in the war even. 
And he says, I don't understand it myself. You're absolutely right, Shaul Yisraeli, that we're, it's creating a risk. It's creating a danger and a, a lack of effectiveness in our military campaign. But what can I do? It's like kashrut. Even if I would like to eat something that's not kosher, the halacha is I can't. And he says, to me, this is the halacha. I'm not making it up. I'm not trying to bootstrap to understand a per- particular political ideology. This is what I understand to be the halacha, and I have no choice. We have to somehow figure out how to uh, be successful within the confines of this limitation. And Rav Gorin put that forth as part of the Israeli military ethic. As I said, people do not always agree with everything that he says, but he was the chief rabbi of the, the army. He was the chief rabbi of the state of Israel. And even as people attacked him on these matters, he did not come back down from them. Again, I don't know what's the right answer in the impossible moral dilemmas that we are often confronted with a ceasefire now to get more hostages, but at the same time, let people escape who are going to come back and attack us again. It's not None of this is, is easy or simple, but I think Rav Gorin is a voice that allows us to to understand the challenges. You know, I don't know what Rav Gorin would say today. Um, the case in Lebanon was different, and battle with different nations are different. Hamas has an advantage over any of our other enemies by celebrating the cult of death, right? Unlike Japan, even Germany, that's willing to surrender in order to protect their people at before they're being totally annihilated. I'm not sure Hamas would do that because once you celebrate the death of your citizens as an advantage, as a positive, I'm not sure how far you can go short of death and killing your enemies in this case. So I'm not sure if Rav Gordon would say the same thing he said about Lebanon in 1982, that he would say what he would say today. But I think this gives us a general framework. What I want to end, though, is one thing that I do hope Rav Gordon would say today, as he said, not in, in 1982, but in 1973. 1973, of course, was one of the last times that uh, we were terribly surprised, the famous uh, Yom Kippur War. Um, and it, of course, was was devastating to us. Uh, and many people view that as one of the absolute worst wars that we were ever in, because we were caught by surprise and so many people died during the initial the initial days. Uh, Chaim Herzog, the, the current uh, president, right, he's related to the current president, wrote a book called Milchemet Yom Hadin, and in it he describes that, ironically enough, the miracles that took place during the Yom Kippur War are more numerous than any of the other wars we've had combined. The stories that came out of what took place and how you know one person in one tank was able to hold off and fend off against all odds, so many Syrian tanks and the like, and how the war ends with us you know, within kilometers of Damascus, within 130 kilometers of Cairo. Uh, he says it's the most miraculous of all the wars. And Rav Gorin says this was, Yom Kippur War was also the most miraculous of all the wars we've ever been in, even more so than the 1967 Six-Day War or the 1948. And he actually makes the argument, he says, you know, some people, religious people, recite Hallel on Yom Hatzma'ut, the Israel Independence Day. And the reason why we celebrate it is because there was a miracle that Israel was reestablished in 1948. He says some people don't yet say Hallel in 1948. It wasn't a big enough miracle because of the war. It wasn't as successful as we would have liked. And he says, after 1973, not after 1967, which you might think six days we win, but after 1973, he says, to those who are not saying Hallel, now you absolutely have to, because this war, not because of how it started, but because how we recuperated, how we were devastated, and how we were almost at the brink of despair, but we didn't fall over the other edge of despair, and we regrouped, we reunited, and we were able to fight back and actually become incredibly successful. He says, that makes it the most miraculous. And and I guess to a certain extent, my my tefillah is that Rav Gorin's correct about this war as well. It started off absolutely horrendous through the surprise and the brutality and the terror and all of the like. And I don't necessarily see how, but hopefully the, the one who never sleeps 
will show us the way that we will end victoriously in a way that is more miraculous than ever before. And the fact that it will take place during Hanukkah perhaps should only strengthen that idea. And it should also make us aware that we're approaching Hanukkah and the, the power of the spirit during that time, that even without the military victory, what Am Yisrael has been accomplished today, you, you cannot believe. I went to a hotel just a, an hour or two before I got on here to visit some of the evacuees from Stay Rote. There is a guy with eight kids living in one bedroom, and he cannot stop praising all the kindnesses that people have done for him and how wonderful. Uh, how wonderful people have taken care of him and if they've taken his kids out and they've set him up in nursery schools and schools and there and he's absolutely overcome with 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 gratitude for everyone and there's story after story of heroism both in the civil front on the war front that cannot be believed and the strength of the nation is stronger than I've ever seen it before and so in that sense perhaps Rav Goran's correct that already we've seen so much and it should just only continue in the exact same direction. Again, thank you so much for listening and sharing with me uh, uh, tonight's ideas. Thank you so much, Rabbi Pear. It was a wonderful presentation. And thanks again for being here. Have a great rest of your day.